Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Milian Trulov. I'm the Vice President and Dean of Admission and Financial Aid. Um, and I have got um, Dr. K here, and Carnell and I are just going to spend the next hour just having a conversation about things you want to know about. It should be, uh, should be a lot of fun. What do you say, Carnell? Sound like a plan? Yes, let's get started. All right, let's get started. Let's get to the big one. Um, what's the plan in the fall? Our plan is to be back in person in the fall. So you know, that's the that's million dollar <laughs> question. Are we going to be back in the fall in person? Yes, we're going to be back in fall in person. Um, and so um, as we know, vaccines is the thing that is helping us get back to that place as well. But you probably all have been seeing lots of um, lots of information out there that the college is keeping up to date on even um, still folks who may um, who may get COVID and what we're doing about that still. So we will still have some mitigation plans in place. Um, it's not it's not over. So I just want folks to know it's not over yet, but we will be back in person um, and really excited about um, what's to come. So included in that is um, the residence halls. So I know folks are like, well, what does that mean? And what does that mean for the residence hall? So we will be in double occupancy um, for, for our residence halls, um, which we found this year, a lot of our students were like, they were like, can we, we want a roommate, <laughs> even though we were still in this space of like, we want a roommate, we want to connect. And we think we, we, we have a sense that, you know, the, the piece around building community and isolation was really hard um, on, on students this past year. And so we're trying to create, again, that sense of community um, and at least have folks be able to connect with, with their peers. Um, and there may be friends that they have that they want to live with as mm -hmm. well. Um, this is sort of interesting. I didn't realize folks knew about this, but I've had four people ask about the sports center. And so if, if many of you don't know, um, we're in the Pacific Northwest and, you know, we've got um, buildings that were designed in 1960 for Pacific Northwest winters. Winters are now different. <laughs> and we had a huge snow and, and the roof of our sports center did collapse. And so um, folks are curious about the timeline and the plans for the, for the sports center. You know, you know, when you say, um, you know, the Pacific Northwest and the design and all that good stuff, <laughs> I, what, what I hear you saying is uh, that's my love for mid-century design. Just <laughs> um, So for those of you who are, you know. Thanks for translating that. Yeah, I, that that's that mid-century design, <laughs> flat roofs, things of that nature. Um, but um, we, we, we will, we will, we will be opening back up in the in the fall. So we obviously we won't have an actual um, the gymnasium part of the sports center available because that's what we are working on right now um, with campus to really explore what the opportunities there could be for the student body um, and for the campus community. But we will we will open up the sports center. Um, so fitness classes, things of that nature. Um, in addition to that, we also have um, we also have a number of our out programs that will hopefully be happening outdoors as well. So we, you know, we're in the Pacific Northwest, the outdoors is our backyard too. So I don't want us to discount that piece, but I know when it gets colder, folks are like, I want to be, I want to be able to work out in, inside and we will have that as, as an option for, for students. This, I'll, you know, let's, let's make it a little fun. Um, why don't you share one of your spots? So for those of us who've never been to Portland, what's your favorite site around the area? Oh, so I'm, this is how I'd say more than one one place. Um, so I will say one of my favorite places just in general, I'm someone who loves to be by water. And so I will say being down by the river downtown is kind of cool. It's really neat to, to, to walk the, you know, walk the river, the river path, really cool. Um, the other thing that I have really appreciated and love is um, if, if you haven't had a chance, well, for, for those of you, when you come to Portland, and even some of our, I've heard some of our Portland folks haven't actually went out to Multnomah Water, the Multnomah Waterfalls, um, which is another just cool piece of like just nature. Um, so I'm, I, 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 that's a, that's another one. Mm -hmm. When it comes to um, food, I will, I will have to just say the food cart scene is legit here. So um, I would <laughs> recommend you can go to any it's the real it deal. which food cart. cart pot you go to just go to a couple you will get something different from different places um so that's i think is another like one of my other favorite other favorite things what uh typical issues do we we see that students typically have during their freshman year 
And what are expectations for parent involvement in supporting students or being hands off? Yeah. So, you know, I always tell the story about in, in my career of working in higher education, specifically around how parents engage. And so I, I, I tell the story, I'm a storyteller, by the way, so sorry if it's, I'm, I'm going to try to get to it very succinctly. <laughs> um, but um, I, I had this conversation with a group of parents one time where I shared with them that I had a parent, we were having a school dance and it was Halloween and the parent dressed up. In ho- during Halloween and showed up to the dance. And I was like, <laughs> you can't be here. This is for the students. Um, what what was then, the costume though? I don't know. It was like a Freddy Krueger. Like, <laughs> they had a whole mask on, so you couldn't see them. Like, That's the kind of costume you have to them. commit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like, it wasn't like a, a cape. It was right. like No, it was like a whole and- mask, everything. Um, <laughs> and then I've had the, I've had the, the parent that has said, you know, we are handling some really sensitive issues for our students and helping them navigate some of the things and and we want parent involvement. And one parent, I remember one parent shared, you know, that's your problem, you can figure it out, you can deal with it. And I say, I don't like the extremes. I wouldn't, I would say, I want to find parents to be engaged somewhere in the middle. You know, we want to be in a partnership together with with how we support, um, support students. And so that is, when you think about orientation, when you come in for orientation, we have a parent orientation. Think about all the resources that come from that. And then how do you help your help your student actually tap into those resources? So um, utilize those, but also stay stay in the loop of what, what we're doing. We have resources here and we don't expect students to come here and be self-made. You know, they have to they have to learn how to take advantage of these resources, particularly with a different set of networks. And our student life is that network, but they can't activate that. And those are active conversations that happen with the student life staff and those happen with the faculty. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And I think that close advising relationship is a great example of people who say, um, I can tell you, um, particularly in the last year over COVID, I think once every two weeks, I get an email from a faculty member and we're triangulating support for a student because of my role in financial aid. And I'm talking to folks in your office um, and so I think for any school, it's going to be a challenge, but um, what I want folks to really talk more about is how we're intentional about making sure that people don't fall to the wayside. Right. They're curious about how people are active, if they get involved, about club sports and intramurals. I, I think because Reed doesn't participate in NCAA Division Three sports, some people are like, well, you must not do anything, but we've got a robust intramural life. Um, we've got people who are involved in archery. Um, our intramural soccer team is really good. <laughs> you know, the, the basketball team is good. Can you talk a little bit about the way that people are still getting physically engaged? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, and I guess there's, there's a lot of different ways. Um, and everything from, we have this requirement for P, you know, that's, it's an, it's a requirement for P and folks are like, I have to take P in college. You're like, yes, you have to take P in college because it actually is about that holistic wellness aspect of things. And we have a range of PE classes. So, so for folks who are not necessarily the intramural or sports type of, of, of student, we have other things. And some of those things could be every, everything from We have a a mindfulness meditation group um, of bird watching, for example, which is kind of cool, to everything from yoga to Tai Chi. And and it was, for me, being new to to the college this this year, one of the things that I found really cool was to see a Tai Chi class happen every, almost like a couple times a week out on the Great Lawn was kind of cool. I'm like, that doesn't happen in the middle of of any urban city. Like, it happens on Reed's campus, which is really cool. Um, But to be intentional about that. The other piece of this is the the activity aspect. So again, it's moving beyond just, okay, yes, we have um, our sports and our, our intramural sports, our outdoor programs, things of that nature, but it's it's also the, we, we do what we call semester surprise, where we'll have, um, where the student government puts on um, essentially a surprise. You don't know about it. You get an email the day before saying, so tomorrow is going to be semester surprise and it can, it's everything from food and activities and things of that nature where students can come together. Can you give us an idea of how um, how the campus supports diversity, um, some of the ways that um, students are realize their experiences on campus? Yeah. So I would say, you know, um, Reed as a predominantly white institution, you know, um, is 
Um, one that we are making very intentional efforts to make sure that folks who are coming from marginalized identities are supported um, and working and, and my and our work doesn't just happen just in the office for institutional diversity it actually happens across the college um, in in a lot of different meaningful ways and so for for us in student life that is also about um, creating opportunities for for students who may have a particular interest in um, um, some type of program or activity. Um, it also is about, um, when I think about health and counseling in particular, for example, this year we are hiring two counselors who have a special focus as it relates to um, providing support from a racial trauma lens, um, as well as an intersectional lens, uh, thinking about our LGBTQ uh, plus students. Um, and how the, the, that there's particular supports there. And even on our health services side of providing support when it comes to um, uh, 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 gender affirming uh, counseling and health services. So whether that's uh, hormone therapy, things of that nature, uh, th that piece is there to um, the, the pieces around working very closely with MRC, which is the multi, uh, Multicultural Resource Center in SEEDS, which is our student, um, um, our service, um, service um, office that helps us think through ways that we can engage the community and the larger, the larger community as well. Let's see, I'm gonna ask, uh, answer a quick question. Why doesn't Reed participate in <laughs> the ranking? Me. Bless you. In and of itself, um, US News and World Report is looking at things that are important to college students and we don't have any problem with that. Um, the thing that I also do is ask folks if they think this is more important to them or less important for them. And that's where we get, that, that's where the really interesting part happens. Um, I believe everyone, everyone's list probably looks a little bit different. And what happens with US, World, US News and World Report is colleges start sort of going after the same thing. And um, someone else has established that um, parameter for them um, rather than the institution itself deciding what's important for them. Um, and so when U.S. News and World Report was first launched, we were in the top 10. Um, since then, we've walked away and said, you know, we, we believe that um, we shape our future. We're not going to do any funny things in the admission process to um, help uh, elevate our place in the rankings. And, you know, while that might be useful data, it might be useful in different proportions to me, to you, and to other folks. Um, so rather than to sort of just step in and what we think is a somewhat confusing arena, we've decided not to take part of that. Uh, we're one of the few schools that ha have been able to step away from the rankings and is still considered in the top 100. Um, part of that is because of penalties that are applied for schools that don't participate. But I think it's uh, about aligning where our values are. That just wasn't part of our values. And so that's not something that we lean on to help uh, illustrate our experience. We do a lot of this, talk to people about who we are and what's important to us. What resources do we have on campus to support students with mental health issues? Um, um, you know, do we have a sense that mental health issues are becoming more prevalent? Um, and um, how do we help that help, help ensure that students stay supported while they're here? Of course, we have mental health supports on, on campus. And mm -hmm. some of those things, um, um, as I said, we have a, a talented health and counseling center. Um, and so I know someone also was asking about is health services on campus. Health services is on campus. They're, they're walkable actually from the residence halls. Um, and also is our counseling services. So um, everything from group therapy to individual counseling. And I think one of the things that we learned this year from um, during COVID, we were able to do uh, telecounseling as well. So we were able to do it in a virtual, in a virtual setting, um, which actually made it even more accessible for our students. And so that's something we're going to actually continue to do um, for the, for this coming year is to be able to have space um, for students who may not want to necessarily come in person and do their counseling session, but they want to do it virtually. Um, so we will continue to do that as well as, um, as well as the help pieces too. So we'll be able to do both in-person and virtual with, with the health aspects. In addition, we do, we have a, a group that's called uh, the Read Care Team. And the Read Care Team is a group of uh, folks from across campus that really uh, help to support students before things become a crisis. So 
you know, if a faculty member has a concern or a family member or a parent has a concern about their student before it's even a, a crisis situation, we're able to step in and provide support. And so um, the Read Care team is, is a phenomenal group that, that really engages and provides direct support to students in a very much more individual perspective. So non-clinical kinds of case, uh, case support and case work in a sense, but when necessary to then get them referred over to, to um, the HCC if there is a need for medical or um, uh, counseling support. So we have someone who wants to know about um, substance free on campus, about drug use on campus and drug culture on campus. Um, and so um, great time to talk about this. This is one of the things that <laughs> you know, I see some stuff online and it just, just drives me crazy. But, you know, Karna, I'll let you, I'll let you talk about this and maybe I'll yeah. talk about it. Um, so, you know, I, when I think about um, alcohol and drugs on campus, it, you, Reed is not immune to any other campus, like, like any other campus that have, folks have alcohol and drugs. However, one of the things that we make it a point to articulate is that we do have policy centered around that. And so um, it's important for us to make sure that our students are safe um, and safety is, is where we start. Um, and also we have a responsibility because we are also bound by bylaws. And so some of those things of, of automatically thinking about, well, you know, recreational marijuana, well, we still don't allow it on campus, even though it's, it's, a, it's legal here in, this, in the state, we, we don't allow it on campus. Right. Um, and so that's something that we, we continue to have, we have those conversations about. Um, but when I look at over time, um, and, and this is actually something that I took a look at when I first started at Reed was to try to get a sense of, okay, where has, where has Reed been over the years? And I have seen through the data of seeing that there's been a decline of, of alcohol and drug use on campus, um, which is, I think, really helpful for, for me to say, okay, there's this narrative about Reed way before I even got here, maybe even three or four years ago that Reed was this school that there are lots of alcohol and drugs constantly. Mm -hmm. And actually when I look at the data about what that sh looks like now, that's actually not the same, it's not the story anymore. Um, and so one of the things that I have been doing this year with, with students in the campus community is trying to rearticulate, okay, here's what the data is saying. Like, this is not our story anymore. This is not right. the narrative. Um, there's been a lot of work around making sure that, that um, we provide opportunities for students, uh, substance-free opportunities, things of that nature, but also recognizing that um, sometimes alcohol and drugs is connected also to this piece around mental health. So for students who may have challenges with substance abuse, we have supports there. We, we have our counselors who are trained to, to provide support and if, if it goes beyond their, their capabilities, we have great referrals in the city that we work with as well for, for students. So we've seen the we've seen the two conflated in some sense, you know, because um, when we think about mental health as well connected to this, um, folks are like, well, I just it's a way for me to relax or it's a way for me to kind of de-stress. But when we think about okay, what does that mean? How do we help our students create healthy behaviors mm -hmm. for what they're gonna have to experience once they leave read? We want to make sure that we're helping helping to provide um, um, mechanisms and um, ways and coping strategies for students that are not dependent upon alcohol and drugs. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Carnell. Particularly what you said about it, it is no longer our story, and um, you know, so I've you know, in, in my position, I have to be aware of this stuff, and I'm taking a look at national data, seeing that our numbers look the same as you know, private selective liberal arts colleges. And you know, back when I had a national comparison, since then they've increased by two decreased by two thirds. They're two thirds or a third of the incidents that we had even mm -hmm. seven years ago. Right. And so um, this is a place, and, and you know, we're really transparent in the mission process. If that's what you're looking for in a college, this is not the place for you. And I think we're unapologetic about that. Um, but this is also a place that supports our students and makes sure that they can get support in many different ways. But the typical read student feels very conversant talking about things that are taboo. And I think that um, being conversant, talking about mental health issues, about drugs, about gender identity is a way that our community reflects inclusiveness and openness. And um, that's not anything I think anyone would sacrifice is this really uh, place where you can authentically engage in conversations, no matter your background, no matter who you're from. And I think that's something that's really iconic to this place. And I wanna make sure that doesn't get uh, uh, misconstrued. Can you tell us how Senate works? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think folks want to get a sense of sort of student life. So 
can you tell us how student government orientation and just, you know, the average first year of a student looks like? So just some of these student facing experiences. Yeah. So part of, you know, one of the things that I think about um, student senate and I actually before I started to read, I had a great conversation with the with the then um, student body president as part of my onboarding. I said, I want to talk to students and I want to talk to the student senate leadership. Student senators are elected by the student body um, to represent them. And so um, um, student senators, there are probably about, I want to say, 10 to 12 student senators. Um, there's a student body president and vice president, treasury as well, that helps provide funding for clubs and organizations and activities for students, um, in addition to um, helping to address some of the, the concerns of, of the student body. And so they're there to provide support and, and, and connect um, with college administration um, around the various things that, that are in students' minds. Um, and, and they also are involved in the welcoming of our students back to campus. So they're, our student senators typically are also involved in lots of different things. So they are just not a student senator. Typically, they may be an orientation leader. They may actually be an admissions tour guide. They um, are working on campus as well. So they don't just live the life of, I'm just a student senator all the time, but they get the opportunity to also engage students in, in other ways, in other meaningful ways. And the other thing is that our students come up with lots of ideas. So even if you as a first year student is like, I wish we would be, I could, we, we could be doing this or we should do that. And you can bring those ideas up to student senate and student senate will be like, okay, let's try to get you some funds to, to put it on. Right. Um, the radio station is another op. I mean, so there's just lots of, there are lots of opportunities for our first year students to engage. Colonel, you have experience at other colleges, um, at other places. You're now here at Reed. What are some of the things that you think are particularly distinctive about Reed, um, whether it's with the students, the faculty, the staff, or just the overall college? Um, I will say what's really unique um, is that when we talk about our students and their student success, that's something that goes across the college, not just your faculty members, but also the staff members, even to the place of like, okay, our, our, our folks who are working in dining as well, like folks talk about student success quite often. And that is something that, I, as I have worked at other institutions, it's not necessarily very clear and in, 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 in as valued. And so a big part of this is that everyone is invested and even students are also invested in the, um, invested as well. The sense of community, the passion that folks have, um, the, the, the pieces around, we talk about, um, we do talk about student autonomy, but I have been having these conversations with our students lately about um, collaborative autonomy, because in, 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 in its truest form, student autonomy is so individualistic. And the reality is Reed doesn't practice in an individualistic way. We are very much a community and we collaborate with each other. And so that's been another piece of this that I, I would say I value is that students, faculty and staff are again, all working toward a common goal. And that's again, is to make the student experience the best for our students um, and to make sure that folks, again, get to graduation, but more than just getting to graduation is that they leave Reed with an experience that they can look back on and say, I'm proud of what, of what I've done, the work that I've done, the academic pieces that I've done, the, the experience and the relationships that I've built. Um, and that's something that doesn't necessarily happen at all places, so. This is one that's coming up often. I, and I know we, I, I know the answer to this Cornell, but are we gonna require the vaccination in the fall, the COVID vaccination? So we're, we're, we're not requiring the um, vaccine. Um, however, we recognize that probably about 70 to, to 90% of our campus community will actually have had the vaccination. Um, and there are a number of reasons why everything from, can we actually mandate it? Um, and, and some, as you know, there's some schools that are, that are, that are mandating, but they're still, that's still to be debated here in Oregon, by the way. So that's not, that's not, um, um, it's not just a, a, a given. Um, but also, um, as I said, the majority of folks will actually most likely be vaccinated. We're, we're having vaccination clinics on campus for our students. We will have the vaccine on campus for students in the fall as well, in case we need boosters or anything like that come, come the fall. So um, we will have a lot of, of resources as it relates to, to the vaccine and providing it to students, but we're not gonna require it though. I am going to ask the last question. And Carnell, uh, this is for both of us. I've been saving this one. 
Um, how do you personally define the honor principle and what's an example of it that you've seen in action? Is that oh, great? Yeah, that is a great question. I'll let you start. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I, I'm still new. That's I'm, so still, real. I'm still new. I'm still, tr- I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> okay. I'll tell folks what I, what I perceive the honor principle is. Um, this is, this is um, something that's not codified, but it's something that really, I think, defines uh, the way that the Reed community approaches um, our interactions with each other. For me, it's taking in consideration about how our words and how our actions impact other people. Um, so for example, um, uh, we, don't, we don't have assigned parking spaces on campus. I don't know a college campus that doesn't have parking that's for like commuter students, parking that's for long-term parking, faculty and staff. But in my mind, it's the best example of the honor principle. I'm not gonna leave my car in the parking lot for four weeks if I, you know, at the spot that's at the very front, if I know that's gonna be used for someone else. I'm thinking about how my action will impact other people. And, it, and it's very simple, but it's also, I think one of the best ways to show how the honor principle is not just in these big events and these big mm-hmm. moments, but um, just over the course of your experience, how they're just really small places um, um, that, that, that it really takes hold. Of course, there's larger places, but I told Carnell this, this is one of the reasons why I chose to come to read is because this idea of um, being honest and how you're engaging other people was a high value for me. And this is a place that articulated that up front. And I, you know, what I would add about the honor principle is that um, I, I think folks tend to think that it's only, it only applies to students. And actually this is a community wide principle. It's not just for right. students, it's yeah. faculty and staff as well. And so that's one thing that I, I, I appreciate too about the honor principle is that you know, at many other institutions, if they do have an honor principal, it's only for the students. And actually this is more around being a community collectively. And that's again, gets back at the heart of who we are and why we, wh- why we do what we do, um, is that there's a collective energy and a collective effort about making sure that we can leverage all of our resources and supports in ways that support each other. Um, and, and that is one um, of the things that, that the honor principal for me articulates um, and it continues to remind me like when I'm working with a staff member or a faculty member or a student, um, it just continues to remind me that um, we're not in this by ourselves, that we should be thinking about others and that even when we leave this campus, that we should continue to actually still operate in that same way. We are, we're in a society where we should be connecting with each other and, and to think about our collective good um, and the impact that we're having on each other. And every little interaction and action actually does matter. 